Hello everyone and welcome to episode number 113 of the weekly series 50 Years Ago in Hockey podcast. I'm your host Rick Cole and every week right here on the Hockey Podcast Network we take a trip down memory lane back in time 50 years and we report on all the hockey news that was taking place at that time exactly as it happened written by some of the greatest sports writers of all time. In this show, we're looking at the week of December 20th to 26th, 1971. And before we get going too far this week, what we'd like to do is uh, wish everybody the best of this holiday season, however you celebrate. Things aren't ideal this year, and that's a gross understatement to say the least. But you know what? We all have to get through it, and we can do it together together. Uh, lean on everybody if you need to be that leaning post for someone who needs it but enjoy the holiday season and uh, enjoy the time with your family I'm very lucky this year both my kids are going to be here for uh, at least part of the holidays and although we won't be able to get together with everyone we'd like to we still think it's going to be a very joyous season and we we take some comfort in that If you like what we do here on the Hockey Podcast every week and every day on Twitter, you can help us out by going to patreon.com slash hockey 50 years and subscribe to this podcast. Subscribers get early access to every week's free podcast, but that's not all. We have some very special uh, content that we put out several times a month and uh, some really neat stuff in the hopper that we're, we're working on right now. Uh, including a a pretty interesting show where we're going to talk about the life of minor league hockey players right from uh, junior up to the minor pros. We found found some very interesting features that we want to talk about over the next little while. So if you'd like to get in on all that, go to patreon.com slash hockey 50 years. Subscribe for some uh, interesting historical content you likely won't find anywhere else. So the week began with things beginning to take on a bit of a familiar look in the NHL's Western Division where the Chicago Blackhawks had opened up a seven-point lead over the second-place Minnesota North Stars. Next best team in the West, the California Golden Seals, was 15 points in arrears of Minnesota. So it was basically, as you could see, a two-team race in the West. In the Eastern Division, the Rangers began the week still leading Boston and Montreal by three points. Uh, Montreal, Boston tied for second. The Bruins got the nod though there. They had two more wins than the Habs and the Toronto Maple Leafs at that point in time were occupying the fourth and final playoff spot a dozen points ahead of the Detroit Red Wings. The Red Wings, by the way, had a a lot of hope for the future at this point in time in the persons of two stars on the United States Olympic team uh, going to Sapporo, Japan uh, in February. Uh, These two players were Tim Sheehy and Henry Boucher. While the U.S. club had posted a 23-4-3 record against uh, all a real mixture of opponents professional minor league teams included Uh, Henry Boucher had been scoring at a two point per game clip Boucher and Tim Sheary are both Minnesota natives by the way they're big guys they like to play a rugged style and the Red Wings are eagerly awaiting them reporting to the team coach Johnny Wilson of the Red Wings said that the reports on these boys were pretty bright Uh, Wilson said that they've got all the ingredients to be very good professional hockey players at the NHL level and it won't take them that much time to get there they've got good shots they can handle the puck and Wilson says the big thing is they both can skate The Toronto Maple Leafs lost a highly regarded goaling prospect this week. 
Dan Proudfoot of the uh, Toronto Globe and Mail informs us that Murray McLaughlin has left the Tulsa Oilers of the Central Hockey League to consider his future, uh, which really upsets the plans of the Maple Leafs, who thought all along that his future was between the pipes of their nets at Maple Leaf Gardens. McLaughlin is a 23-year-old netminder from Toronto, and he caught the Leafs' attention while he was playing for the University of Minnesota. His play this season was considered much improved over that of last year, his first professional year with Tulsa in the CHL. Ray Moran, the Oiler general manager, said, as far as we're concerned, he hasn't quit, so there's no use making a big issue out of it. Miron said that McLaughlin just left the team to get away from hockey for a couple of weeks and make up his mind just what he really wants to do with his life. Miron said that McLaughlin indicated he was going to to Minnesota to visit his fiance before returning to Toronto. The goaltender was scheduled to start for the Oilers last Friday, but before the game, he told Miron he was just not in any frame of mind to play. He remained with the team as a backup goalie for the weekend, and he talked again with the Oilers general manager, on Sunday. Ray Ray Miron said he's just down in the dumps. He says he's having trouble getting up for the game. When he said he didn't want to play last Friday, he said it was just because he felt he couldn't do justice to himself or the team. He said there's just no way that he could play. Now, Miron did emphasize that McLaughlin's decision came as a complete and total surprise. Uh, Miron said he hadn't noticed anything wrong with Murray at all. Uh, He's usually a quiet guy anyway, and he never says a lot, and he hadn't blown up or got mad or showed anything, at least not anything that team management had noticed. McLaughlin and Ron Lowe had been alternating as the starting goaltenders for the Oilers. McLaughlin's goals against average was 3.30 and he had worked during eight wins and uh, seven losses. Lowe had been in goal for eight wins, three losses, and two ties. Toronto general manager Jim Gregory said the matter was in Miron's hands. We hope he changes his mind, that's all, and we hope to see him back. While uh, McLaughlin is gone, the Leafs are bringing in 23-year-old Gordon McRae, who played goal at Michigan Tech, and he's going to be Ron Lowe's backup in Tulsa. Emil Francis, the cool cat who runs the New York Rangers, is a little hot under the collar because of the National Hockey League schedule. The Rangers held their annual Christmas party with Santa Claus and all the ingredients early in the week at Madison Square Garden. And for the players and their families, that's going to have to do over Christmas because the players will be separated from their loved ones. Thanks, of course, to the NHL schedule. The Rangers spend Christmas night in Minnesota, of all places, and in order to be sure they're there in time, Francis, who is, by the way, no Scrooge, must fly the team to Minneapolis on Friday night, which, of course, is Christmas Eve. Now, Francis says it's always been a rule than the NHL to schedule games as close to home as possible on Christmas. So where are the Rangers? Halfway across the country. The only place they could have put us that would have been farther from New York, Francis says, would of course be the West Coast. Now what's more is the Rangers play Montreal at home the day after Christmas. So when the club returns from Minnesota on early Sunday, the players are going to head straight for a Manhattan hotel instead of going directly to their homes. The players, says Francis, won't see their families until Monday morning. That's some scheduling, isn't it? Well, one team that is a little happy is the Boston Bruins, who got Don Marcotte, that uh, strong left winger, back in their lineup this week. Now, you'll remember, Marcotte had back surgery just before the season began. He had a very severe disc problem, and for the past two weeks, he had been basically on a conditioning stint with the American Hockey League Boston Braves. Well, that ended when... uh, 
Marcotte was brought up to the Bruins to reclaim a regular spot in the lineup. And by the way, another injured Bruin player, Don Ory, the rough and tough defenseman, he thinks he's going to be skating by Christmas and back in the lineup in the new year. So the city of Edmonton has a WHA team, World Hockey Association team, scheduled to start play next fall. They don't have a major league rink. Uh, Right now, they don't have any players, of course. Uh, They don't have too many management people in place. So there's a lot of questions about this franchise. Terry Jones, who, by the way, follows us on Twitter and uh, comments from time to time. He was a young reporter with the Edmonton Journal back then. And he got uh, Bill Hunter and Zane Feldman uh, to answer a few questions about the Edmonton WHA club. Uh, There was a press conference at McDonald Hotel. Hunter and Feldman announced operational plans for the team in the months ahead. Uh, Hunter said bluntly that the rumors that Edmonton wouldn't be in the league are completely uh, erroneous. They're false. Feldman, who's an automobile dealer in uh, uh, Edmonton and president of the Western Canada Hockey League Oil Kings is entered in a partnership with Hunter. Hunter is the majority shareholder and the franchise in the WHA is in his name. It was officially announced at the press conference that Hunter would serve as the club's general manager and that he would be selecting a coach within the next couple of months. The club also said that they will be opening a new enlarged office in the McDonald Hotel, which will house both the World Hockey Association and the Oil Kings Junior Club. The WHA team, which is to be called the Oil Kings apparently, may get a new name instead. There might be too much of a conflict with uh, the same name for two teams, said Hunter. We may hold a name the team contest, but we really hadn't made a decision in that area as of yet. Hunter also told Terry Jones that there will be uh, some new staff appointments to handle the the greatly increased business operations of both the professional and and junior teams. The Edmonton franchise will open up a, a season ticket sales to the public January 4th with all junior A season ticket holders in Edmonton having until January 22nd to exercise an option on their present seats for the World Hockey Association. Ticket prices for the WHA team in Edmonton have established at a top price of $6 and then $5.50 and a few general admission tickets will be available at $4. That's basically standing room. Hunter said that the Edmonton Exhibition Association general manager Al Anderson had assured him that the gardens would be spruced up for world hockey. Hunter said it's imperative that we have a new arena in time for at least a half season of play in the second WHA season. That would be 73-74. He said that the organization was working with maximum effort to have a new arena built either publicly or with private funds and both felt Excellent progress has been made in this direction, and there should be an announcement on a building within the next two months for Edmonton. Now, what about that Dayton, Ohio WHA team that uh, was announced? When I saw this, this one come up, that really puzzled me. I didn't know much about Dayton, Ohio, other than the Gems were their team in the International Hockey League, which, by the way, is uh, classified as an amateur uh, league. They are, uh, players are paid, but they're not paid much. Uh, They get jobs pumping gas and stuff like that around town to augment their income, the meager income from hockey. Well, if the Dayton Gem stockholders want to uh, have a more expensive team for Christmas, they're going to wait till five days past the holiday because that is when the WHA Board of Governors is going to discuss a proposal with the GEMS Board of Governors to become part owners of Dayton's World Hockey Association Club. 
the Dayton Gems attorney, Ralph Skilkin, said that he was presented with a letter from Jim Smith, the attorney for the proposed Dayton WHA team. The deadline for the answer is December 31st, and they're going to have a meeting of stockholders on December 30th at 4 p.m. The WHA team president is a fellow by name of Paul Deneau, who apparently has uh, he's an architect, and he had designed the uh, arena that the WHE team would use if it gets built in downtown Dayton. Uh, he said that the intent is to purchase the IHL gems and move them to another city for use as a farm team. But the gems folks are not convinced that this is the way to go. They don't think the WHA, a lot of people don't think the WHA is going to get off the ground in Dayton. So they're going to be very careful about uh, selling their team to the WHA folks. We'll have to see how that goes. 50 years ago, it was a much simpler time. This story, uh, you wouldn't see anything like this today. Uh, nicknames abound among the 1972, 71-72 Toronto Maple Leafs. So Gary Monahan, forward for the Maple Leafs, stands an excellent chance of becoming known on the team as, quote, the thumb. Now, where would you get something like that? Well, Monahan, who already is called Mondo for vague, vague reasons that we won't get into, emerged as a hitchhiker of note recently when his car refused to start. With practice less than an hour away, Monahan, not one of the higher paid players in the league, did not want to get a fine for being late. Well, he remembered his hitchhiking days in junior hockey, so he strode to the side of the Don Valley blacktop and he hitchhiked from the York Mills ramp right up to the door of Maple Leaf Gardens only taking three ride according to the thumb. At 10 to 10 I was at York Mills and by 10 15 I was here in the Leaf's dressing room. The thumb advises that mid-morning hiking is a piece of cake especially if the hiker is clean cut and as well dressed as a professional hockey player might be. Now cynics might suggest that the thumb enjoyed easy success because drivers recognized him. He explains only one of the three drivers seemed to know that he was a professional hockey player. Gary says the first ride took me to Don Mills Road. The first car that came along picked me up and took me to Girard and River Street and I was waiting there for a streetcar when another car came along so I just stuck out the thumb he picked me up and then he took me right to the front door of the Maple Leaf Garden as I, as I mentioned we're planning a, a big special episode it might even go into a, a short series for our Patreon subscribers on life outside the National Hockey League for players and fans alike here's a little taste of uh, something we have in store and we thank the Canadian Press for this, for this particular, we'll just give a little taste of uh, a story that they wrote this week, 50 years ago. Now, what do you tell a goalkeeper who's just faced 101 shots in a single hockey game? Gord Kent says, well, you tell him you just stopped 86 shot. You don't, you don't mention the 14 that got by, or 15 that got by him. And you mentioned maybe, well, if you did stop 15 more, you'd have had a shutout. Can you imagine, as a goaltender, I can't, a 101-shot shutout. The flurry of shots and a 15-1 loss to the Moortown Flags in a Great Lakes Junior Hockey League game, however, didn't get young Tom Anderson, the goalkeeper in question, down, according to his coach, who is Dave Baldwin. For one thing, the 17-year-old Chatham native He's, he's used to these kind of games, believe it or not. The Blades just have one win and one tie to show for 20 games so far this season and have already given up 199 goals. Anderson and backup goalie Al Fisher have given up 84 goals in Blenheim's past seven games and Anderson has faced 232 shots in the past three contests. Baldwin said the more work Anderson gets the better he likes it. Our goaltending believe it or not 
has been our greatest strength. Having a loser hasn't affected crowds in this uh, small community of 3,500, 10 miles southeast of Chatham. Attendance about the same as it was last season. They get about 125 paying customers every game. But despite the team's dismal record, it has shown no signs of detention. Uh, Baldwin said the team hasn't become downhearted and we have yet to have an argument in the dressing room. And that's really quite a feat for a team that is having as bad a season as this one is. Having a patsy is nothing new for the Great Lakes lead, which is a seven-team circuit with four junior B teams and three junior C teams reaching from Moortown near Sarnia in the north to Leamington, southeast of Windsor in the south. Last season, the Tilbury Bluebirds got through a whole schedule without winning or tying a game, and you may have uh, heard us talk about that in one of our shows last season. A little taste of uh, the lower juniors in southern Ontario. In a couple of interviews this week, Gordy Howe, the retired great of the Detroit Red Wings, admitted that he had been offered the Red Wings coaching job when Doug Barkley called it quits earlier this season. Now, Gordy smartly turned down that offer. Can you imagine Gordy Howe having to report to or take orders from Ned Harkness? Well, neither could Gordy Howe. Here's a little another uh, WHA note from midweek. Ed Fitkin, the former Toronto sports writer who also served for many years on Hockey Night in Canada broadcasts, is reported in line for the general manager's job with the San Francisco team in the World Hockey Association. Ed, you will remember, was Jack Kent Cook's right-hand man when the Los Angeles Kings were first established. I guess Ed must have liked California. I don't know whether he'll like it to the north of Los Angeles as much. And this is going to be a much more risky proposition But one must remember, Ed was a sports writer with the Toronto Telegram, which recently went under. So maybe this will be a good fit for Ed Fitkin, one of the real good guys around hockey. Since it is the holiday season, we have a holiday-themed story for you here. A nice story for a change. Now, it won't count in the standings, but the Montreal Canadiens scored a smashing victory for goodwill on their flight home from California this week. Like most of the 300-plus other passengers aboard the Boeing 747, the Canadians had hoped to catch up on their sleep during the flight to Chicago. But someone mentioned there was a piano in the parlor at the rear of the giant aircraft. So, a school teacher from San Francisco started playing some Christmas carols. A few passengers gathered around, bashfully waiting for someone to start singing. Well, Phil Mir, Ray Jean Oul, Denny DeJordi, and Ivan Cornroy went to the back of the plane, and pretty soon the caroling was ringing out throughout the plane as more and more of those over 300 passengers joined in. A tall young veteran from Vietnam who had been talking about, quote, burning my uniform as soon as I came home said the lusty sing song recalled earlier Christmases when his family would gather around the piano in his hometown when the players treated the crown to a, the crowd to a French rendition of Oh Holy Night they were given a standing ovation these guys really have music in their hearts said a long-haired student from Berkeley California man they're not like the other jocks that I've seen Nancy Bradford, the chief stewardess aboard the flight, said that until this flight, she had considered professional athletes a humbug sort of a lot. They can be sulky and even troublesome at times, she said. But these Canadians are something else. We've never had so much fun on a flight that I can ever remember. The people think that these guys are the greatest, the way they've been so polite and cheerful and with everybody on the flight. They made our show for us. Well, they're Canadians. Of course, they're polite and cheerful, and especially at Christmas. 
As the week went on, we had a little more WHA news. Jim Proudfoot of the Toronto Star reported that Peter Mahovlich now of the Canadians had admitted discussing the possibilities of moving to the World Hockey Associations, but he wouldn't say exactly when he talked to him or which of the WHA teams that he had been talking with. And another WHA bit, the Miami team now has a general manager, Les Patrick, a third generation of one of the National Hockey League's most famous families, the Patrick family, has been named to head up the Miami team, which will be known as the Screaming Eagles. The announcement was made by Herb Martin, owner of the WHA franchise. Patrick will take over his GM's position on January 1st, 1972. He is currently the business manager of the Los Angeles Kings of the NHL's Western Division. The 31-year-old Patrick skated in Madison Square Garden at age two. His grandfather, the late Lester Patrick, is of course an NHL legend. Lester's son, Lynn Patrick, played in more than 450 games during his decade as a player with the New York Rangers. A little bit of uh, illness injury news. Yes, illness was even part of the scene back in 1972, although not on the scale that we are experiencing at this very moment in uh, 2021. The Flyers defenseman Larry Brown, who was to return to the team from a stint with Richmond of the American Hockey League this week, won't be making the trip to Philadelphia, and it's probably a good thing. He has been stricken with the highly contagious mononucleosis, and he's going to be out of the lineup for eight weeks. Brown was ending a two-week stay with the, with the Richmond Robins. Uh, he's the second defenseman lost by the Flyers in two days. On Monday, they learned that uh, Brent Hughes has a fractured right wrist, and he's going to be out of the lineup. But the Flyers do have a replacement for him as Wayne Hillman comes back from sitting out a couple weeks with a bruised right ankle. Tough times for defense in Philadelphia. Football fans, I'm sure we all love an action-packed, high-scoring NFL game. But with the latest no-brainer from DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the National Football League, you will be a winner once a single point is scored. New customers who bet just $1 on any team to score can win $100 worth of free bets. It's that simple. If Sportsbook isn't available in your state yet, you can still get in on the NFL action. Everybody can play for huge cash prizes all season long with DraftKings Daily Fantasy Sports Contest. DraftKings has given all new customers a free shot at millions of dollars in total prizes with their first deposit. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code THPN for the Hockey Podcast Network. Bet $1 on any team to score and win $100 in free bets. If they score, you score with promo code THPN this week at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. You must be 21 or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only. New customers only, a minimum $5 deposit, and a $1 wager are required, one per customer. Restrictions do apply. See DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for all the details. And you have a gambling problem, please call one 800 gambler if you were a hockey fan in 1971-72 or have you been following us the last few weeks uh, you know that the financial dealings around the Vancouver Canucks have been a hot mess it seems forever Uh, things might have become a little clearer this week or the waters may have been muddied even more the Bank of British Columbia took over the purse strings of the Vancouver Canucks this week. In return for lending, the NHL team's ultimate parent some $3.5 million to pay off a debt to the uh, Kapazi family of Vancouver, the bank got a director on the board. Under a revamped setup, the directors of Northwest Sports Limited, the corporate name 
of the Canucks will be Tom Scallon and Lyman Waters from Medicor of the United States, the parent company that owns the club. They're the guys who basically received the loan. Vancouver businessmen Cy McLean and Coley Hall and the bank man will make up the rest of the board of directors. This will mean a seven to two majority for Canadians on the board. Herb Capazzi, the man who negotiated his family's loan to Medicor, said these arrangements are designed to keep control of the Canucks in Canada, and we think that's a good thing. The Capazzi family is being repaid by Medicor with the funds now loaned to it by the Bank of British Columbia. The Capazis will end up now with 99,000 shares in Northwest Sports under a clause in their own loan agreement, which provided that they should receive them at a price of $3.52 each. This is considerably less than the market market price, which has been fluctuating, so we really don't have a solid price for that. The shares originally were held by four Canadians, Cy McLean, Coley Hall, plus Max Bell and Frank McMahon, who stayed on the board after the Medicor takeover. That's what made the uh, the count seven to two. Bell and McMahon have not played an active role in the affairs of Northwest Sports. Now, where does Frank McMahon's name sound familiar? Well, to me, I did remember it. When Foster Hewitt in the 1967 expansion made the presentation for the city of Vancouver to be included in the first great expansion of the NHL. He was questioned by the uh, governors of the NHL, the the six pre-expansion teams. Where are the people that we know, like Frank McMahon? McMahon is a buddy of guys like Bill Jennings and, and the Adams family and the Norris brothers, more importantly. And they wondered why their good friend Frank McMahon wasn't on board with a Vancouver NHL team. Well, now he's on the board of an NHL Vancouver team. Saskatchewan sports columnist Bob Strum has a proposal for the National Hockey League to consider regarding alignment of the divisions. Bob writes that taking an outsider's look at the National Hockey League before uh, we go into Christmas, he says, if I were Clarence Campbell, president of the league, I'd put serious thought into realigning the league's divisional system, probably along the lines of the old country soccer setup. And I think I've heard this before. I don't think we've talked about it though. Progressional divisions would provide demanding incentives other than playoff spots and money. Plop the top six NHL teams, Bob says, into a first division with four to qualify for the playoffs. Have a look at the point spread as of now in the NHL. If Chicago, New York, Boston, Montreal, Minnesota, and Toronto were in the same division, 49, 48, 45, 45, 44, 38 in that order. That's 11 points between the first and sixth spot in that division shuffle the other clubs into a second division with four of the eight to earn postseason spots in this lower grouping and look at the race they'd have going there california 27 detroit 26 philadelphia 25 pittsburgh 25 st Louis 23 vancouver 20 buffalo 20 and los angeles 15 instead of the la kings being a distant 34 points out of first place as they already are in the present Western Division, they'd be only a dozen away from first place in the so-called Second Division. The NHL scheduling would not have to be changed in the least. Each club could still play its 13 opponents an equal number of times. In that way, the fans in the second division cities would still get a look at the best players in the circuit. And for a little added incentive, Strum says he'd move the top two finishers in the second division up to the number one grouping each year and drop the bottom two clubs who didn't make the playoffs in the first down to the second grouping. There would be status at stake. There would be closer races for playoff spots. And there would be fewer arguments on parity because the obvious inequities presently would be a little less obvious, unless, of course, if you think about this. 
The Vancouver Sun's Bob Dunn tells us that the firing of Canucks coach Hal Laco must be imminent, and he puts out this evidence for us. First of all, he says at this point, the Canucks have lost five in a row, one short of the worst stretch in their first season. Uh, however, the six they lost consecutively last year were all on the road, and all the clubs that beat them at that time made the playoffs. Of the current five setbacks, three have been on home ice, three have been to Detroit and Buffalo, neither of which club is considered playoff material. An undetermined number of players have lost or are losing confidence in themselves because they're not getting enough ice time. They interpret it as a lack of confidence on the coach's part. Then there are suggestions being made, some of them in light of the Canucks' two losses this week, 5-1 in Buffalo, 3 nothing up to Detroit the previous night. The game's were two of the more important ones, four-pointers, as they say. Uh, so they're making a few suggestions. One, well, Laco's practices have been anything but tough. Surprisingly, in view of the loss to Buffalo Sunday, the practice in Detroit was basically a laugher for both both workouts this week. He ran proceedings from outside, even outside the ice surface, in street clothes with a whistle, standing on a bench. He didn't even go on the ice. Neither workout lasted more than an hour. And one veteran NHL observer said that Laco, who spent more than a decade coaching in the Western Hockey League, that Hal Laco has failed to progress with hockey coaching's advances and basically the game has passed him by. Well, it seems this season, one of the overriding themes that's gone on right from nearly the beginning has been coaching changes. And we thought after the flurry that we had a few weeks ago that maybe uh, things will calm down for a while and the coaches can kind of relax. Well, that wasn't the case. But this one was a doozy that we didn't see coming. The St. Louis Blues on Christmas Day fired their new coach, Bill McCreary. Yeah, it was Christmas Day. McCreary had been sounding like he was the guy who had the recipe to the secret sauce that makes winning hockey. He had lots to say all all over uh, the, the league as he met the press. But the problem was, whatever he was selling, the, the team just wasn't buying. So the Blues on Christmas Day fired former player Bill McCreary and guess who they named as coach? Well, for the second time, former defenseman, former team captain, and former coach Al Arbor was asked to take over the reins of the struggling National Hockey League team. General Manager Sid Abel said, We're at a critical stage of the season right now, and we can't afford to wait to make the change. Abel said that as of late, the team hasn't been able to score uh, they feel they have some talent, but that they just haven't been responding. Abel says we got into a slump, and it just didn't look like we're going to come out of it. Abel said he thinks the big thing will be trying to restore the confidence of the player. Abel also said the team has an injuries problem, but that can be overcome with the right attitude. Sid a tip for you. Al Arbert was a good professional defenseman, especially in the expanded NHL. One of the best shot blockers of all time. But Al Arbor was never an offensive player. Please don't ask him to teach these guys how to score. For our final segment this week, uh, I guess this is maybe a little bit of a gift for everyone. Uh, my gift to you, I guess. One of my favorite NHL personalities in those days was Gump Worsley, and who didn't love Gump Worsley? We haven't talked about Gump much lately, although as you know, we did mention he and Cesar Maniego leading the NHL goalkeeping derby in goals against average for a time. Well, we've got a, a bit on him here, and it's from the great reporter with Newsday magazine out of New York, Tim Moriarty. And we'll, we'll just give you Tim's uh, story here. Gump Worsley is a beautiful man, not in an athletic sense, because considering his scarred, pudgy face and his round body, five foot seven hundred and eighty-five pounds, nobody ever has mistaken the Minnesota goalkeeper 
for a leading man. But Gump Worsley is a beautiful in a different sense. He has been a professional goalkeeper for 23 seasons and he learned to roll with the punches during some lean years with the New York Rangers in the late 1950s and early 60s. And he always, always came up smiling. And at age 42, he remains one of the National Hockey League's best goalies. He still curses like a trooper and is one of only two goalies in the NHL who refuse to wear a mask. Joe, Le- Do- Joe Daly of the Detroit Red Wings, by the way, is the other. Worsley's explanation for not wearing a mask is his age. It's too late to start wearing one of those things now, he says. So Gump Worsley stands in front of his net as he did in the North Stars 1-1 tie with the Rangers, daring people to beat him. Without a mask, it is interesting to watch his facial expressions. And a little side note here. The guy I used to love to see pictures of was Harry Lumley, another, of course, playing in the uh, era of no masks. His facial expressions that uh, Harold Barkley caught at Maple Leaf Gardens when Lum played for the Leafs were amazing. And Gumper is much the same. Gump's jaws are moving constantly as he alternately chews gum and chews out his teammates for mental lapses or congratulates them for a good play. Imagine that, a goalie congratulating teammates for good play. Jack Campbell is not doing anything new, although he's doing something different in 2021 for uh, the Maple Leafs that other pro goalies don't do these days. Well, when there's pause in the action, Gump leans back on the back of the cage or on a stick surveying the crowd looking for old friends and chuckling at the insults that roll down from the stands. When the game resumes, Worsley spits into the glove on his left hand like a catcher waiting for a fastball. He couldn't do that if he was wearing a mask, of course. The opposition moves down ice and Worsley goes into a crouch so that his head is almost even with the net's crossbar. His eyes are following the puck and Gump is ready for anything. Only when his defensemen betray him is Worsley apt to surrender a goal. It happened many times when he was with the Rangers and it happened in the game against the Rangers this week when Ted Harris, a Minnesota big tough defenseman, lost control of the puck in front of the Minnesota goal midway through the third period. Jean Rattel, of all people, was Johnny on the spot. He pounced on the puck and put it between Worsley's pads. It was Rattel's 20th goal of the season, the 200th of his National Hockey League career, and it matched a second period goal by the North Stars' Murray Oliver. It ruined Worsley's shutout bid, and because of that absence of the mask, it was easy to read his lips, and we can't tell you what he said. But the Gumper didn't deny what he said at all. Sure, I cursed. Doesn't everybody? That was like a guy hitting a home run off you with a score one nothing in the ninth inning. A baseball reference from Gump Worsley. Gump, if nothing else, he knew his audience. The only concession Worsley has made to the mod world in recent years is to permit his once famous crew cut to grow long. He rubbed his hair vigorously with a towel, took a drag on his non-filtered cigarette, and talked about two quick stops he made on Vic Hadfield on the Rangers' first rush of the game. Vic tried to jam me with the first one, Worsley said, but I had it all the way. Then he got the rebound, shot, and the puck hit the back of my leg and bounced away. He smiled, having been so fortunate so early in the game. In the second period, Worsley proved again why he'd been able to keep his average around 1.75 for most of the season. By the way, 1.75 goals against per game in 1971-72 was a very, very good number. Now, during this game, as we mentioned, Rattel split the Minnesota defense during a power play, moved in on Worsley. In the Rangers' 5-2 victory at St. Louis Saturday night, Rattel got a similar breakaway and beat rookie Pete McDuffie. But McDuffie lacks Worsley's experience, and Gump said, I could see Rattel had the puck on his backhand and that he was being bothered from behind. There's no way that he could cut inside or move to his forehand, so old Gumper made the stop with a nifty kick save. That earned him an ovation from the Madison Square Garden crowd, maybe even from the guy who had been razzing Worsley since the days when he was playing for the Rangers. 
Gump says there's this one guy who used to give it to me pretty good in the old days. He used to sit in the balcony on the 50th Street side of the old garden, and now he sits in practically the same spot here at the new garden to my right when I'm at the 7th Avenue end of the rink. When it was suggested that maybe this was the fan who hit Worsley in the head with an egg at the old garden several seasons ago and sent him to the hospital with a concussion, Worsley said, nah, I don't think so. This guy would probably punch anybody in the nose if he saw him throw anything. He's a real hockey fan, not one of those idiots. The booing that a professional hockey player takes and Worsley has had to take doesn't bother the gumper one iota, he claims. That's why they pay their money for, right? That's why they get the chance to say what they want. They pay their money. Let them yell. Hell, in Boston, there's a fan who remembers me from my days with New York who still calls me Father Knickerbocker. I couldn't care less whatever Father Knickerbocker means. And what Gump Worsley does care about is winning and nothing more. And though the North Stars didn't win in the game against the Rangers, they didn't lose either. I'll take half a loaf here any day against the Rangers, Gump said. The half loaf extended the Rangers' streak through 15 straight games and left them three points ahead of second place, Montreal and Boston, and that's a game in which everybody, and especially Gump Worsley, went home happy during the holiday season. And so that's this week's show, everyone. Now, what we learn on uh, this uh, very eventful week? A promising Maple Leaf goalie suddenly calls it quits. No one knew why. There was a clue in the story. A girl may be involved. Uh, we got some answers on the Edmonton WHA team, but you know what? There are still so many questions surrounding this franchise. And we had news on who's going to be controlling the hot mess that the Vancouver's financial situation is. And at least that has some clarity, at least for the time being. Now, here's some of the stories we're working on for next week's show an apparently new offer from the World Hockey Association for Derek Sanderson will be made. And it sounds like he and his agent might be taking this one a little more seriously than the first uh, time that the Miami franchise reached out to Derek. The new Atlanta team will find a guy to run the hockey operation in the South. And we may have heard his name before. And as we enter the year 1972... Uh, we'll have a quick look at just how things are looking and what's in store as 1972 will be a year full of hockey news that will change the landscape of hockey, not only in North America, but probably in the world for years to come. And we're going to be there all next year to cover it for you. The 50 Years Ago on Hockey Podcast is produced by Andy Cole. Can't thank him enough for all his hard work. Andy will produce podcasts professionally. If you're interested in getting one going, get hold of me and we'll hook you guys up. Andy is a true media professional, really good at what he does. The very popular Juno-nominated Toronto Indie Rock Group, the Rural Alberta Advantage. Uh, one of the members, my daughter, Amy, they provide our intro and exit music. And if you ever get a chance to see them perform live, they put on a great high energy show. They're hoping if we can get the uh, COVID stuff under control, that next year they'll be out on tour once again. Other musical pieces in the podcast and sound effects are, are crafted by Andy Cole as well. Our research comes from files at the Toronto Star, Toronto Global Mail, and of course, the many publications found at our sponsor, newspapers.com. And don't forget our other sponsor, the Breakwall Brewing Company in beautiful downtown Port Colborne, Ontario. You can find us on Twitter every day at at hockey 50 years we have a facebook page uh, we have a wordpress site hockey 50 years ago.com and of course you can get this podcast through your favorite podcast app thanks again for everyone who tunes in we're getting to the end of 1971 it's been a wonderful year we thank you so much for being with us uh have a good holiday season all the best to you and your family and on that note, we will see you next time. When the ice breaks, when the hot shakes.